Hey, what's going on there guys? Welcome back to another installment of How to Build a Sealed Deck. Many of you guys may have seen my previous installments where I have done various expansions for building sealed decks, but for the purpose of today's episode, we are going to be focusing on 2014 core set, otherwise known as M14. And the materials that we have for this video are six packs of M14, and we have a stack of basic lands, 17 of each, and I'll get into why we have 17 of each and some of the more finer points of sealed. So the first and foremost thing is what is sealed deck? So sealed deck is a format of limited play most popularly played at pre-release events whenever new sets are coming out. And it's a format in which you don't bring a pre-constructed deck. Instead, you're handed six packs, and from those six packs, you open them up, and you're going to build a 40-card deck, as opposed to in Constructed, where you build a 60-card deck. And with that, you're going to play against other opponents. So uh, we are going to go over some of the things that you need to know when you're just kind of playing Sealed for the first time, things that... Not a lot of people understand even um, some small things like how many lands you should include in your deck. And uh, we'll just go over all of that stuff and I'll walk you through what I do for my process of starting off with a sealed deck event. How I, uh, how I approach things whenever I'm handed my six packs and then I'm told to start deck building. So um, we have our six packs here. So the first thing that I like to do whenever I start off and I'm handed my packs is to open them and then sort them by color. So we're going to start off here and just go individually opening them up and sorting them by color. Um, when we look at our cards, one of the biggest things to remember is bread. And that stands for bombs, removal, evasion, aggro, and draw. So... The way that breaks down is we want to grade cards based on their potential for the limited format and what they ultimately can do in our deck. So while opening our packs, we're going to try to see where our bombs are, where our removal is, any evasion creatures, evasion being like flying, unblockable, can only be blocked by like two or more creatures, any of those types of abilities. Um, and then also aggro and drawing engines. Um, or dead drops. There's a lot of different ways that people approach bread and different meanings that they have for it. Uh, but the most common one that I use is bombs removal, evasion, aggro, and then draw. So we'll open up our pack and get started here. Okay, so we'll just start taking these and sorting them by color. So we have a few solid cards right off the bat here. Uh, cards like Rumbling Bayloth, Shock, Claustrophobia, all those are perfectly fine. We have a Divine Favor, Glade Cover Scouts, Dragon Hatchling, Merfolk Spy, Lethargy of Blood, Corrupt, Staff of the Death Magus. You also want to consider any lands, nah, non-colored cards and multicolored cards as well. You want to put those in separate piles. Uh, our rare here is Planar Cleansing. It's a 6 cost sorcery to destroy, destroy all non-land permanents. And then we have our basic, and then we have a Sliver Token. So I'll put that off to the side there. Those really won't matter as much to us. Um, the reason why I have basic lands is just so it makes things easier. Whenever I go to events, I'll bring lands alongside me just because it saves some time. I don't have to go and like stand and wait around for other players to get done grabbing land so I can go grab mine um, that I'm going to need to use for my deck. Uh, it just makes things nicer whenever you have your own lands, speeds things along. Um, but whenever you go to events, if you don't have extra lands to bring along with you, the shop should provide them for you. So uh, it shouldn't be something you should worry about necessarily. It just speeds things along if you have them yourself. Uh, we have a troll hide. We have a Capetian Knight, Lava Axe, Archaeomancer, Altar's Reap, Dragon Hatchling, Hive Stirrings, Advocate of the Beast. We have Sliver Construct, Blightcaster, Millstone, Fleshpulper Giant, 
Our rare is Colossal Whale, so it's a 7 cost card, 5-5 five, five, Island Walk, and whenever it attacks, you may exile target creature defending player controls until Colossal Whale leaves the battlefield. And we have a rare Cyclops Tyrant, which is pretty cool. And we have a Swamp and a Tip card. Put those over, and keep going. Alright, so Corpse Hauler, Cyclops Tyrant, Divination, Rootwalla, Show of Valor, Merfolk Spy, Lethargy of Blood again, Altar's Reap, Pacifism. You also want to keep in mind cards that are like pseudo removal, so Pacifism isn't one of those cards that just says, oh, destroy a creature or exile creature. But it does say enchant creature, and the enchanted creature can't attack or block, so it makes it less of a threat for us. Uh, we have a Deadly Recluse, Fire Shrieker, Elixir of Immortality, Artificer's Hex. Uh, we have Sanguine Blood, so it's an enchantment for 5, and whenever you gain life, target opponent loses that much life. Could be effective if we go along a course of uh, being able to have some lifeline cards or something like that. Not entirely sure why I made two green piles. There we go. That's a little bit more appropriate for us. Uh, then we have an island and a tip card there. We have Time Ebb, Smelt, Ranger's Guile, Accursed Spirit, Dawn Strike Paladin, Armored Cancrix, we have Disperse, Canyon Minotaur, Griffin Sentinel, Tome Scour, Colonian Tusker, which is a pretty solid card for us. 3 3 for just double green is pretty nice. Uh, Blessing. Yeah, we have Young Pyromancer. And we have Thorncaster Sliver, which is a 2 2 for 5. And Sliver creatures you control have when this creature attacks, it deals 1 damage to target creature or player. And a Swamp and a Token. Two more packs left here. Nothing way too overwhelmingly over the top, uh, but we do have some pretty solid cards so far. Uh, we have another Knight, Essence Scatter, Seismic Stomp. We have Undead Minotaur, Messenger Drake, Siege Mastodon, uh, Charging Griffin, Ground Shaker Sliver, Minotaur Abomination, Thunder Strike, Wall of Swords, Rod of Ruin, Stonehorn Chanter, uh, Pyromancer's Gauntlet, so it is a 5 cost artifact, and if a red instant or sorcery you control, or a red planeswalker you control, would deal damage to a permanent or player, it deals that much damage plus 2 to that permanent or player instead. Swamp and a token, and last pack here. Okay, so another claustrophobia. Uh, Marauding Mallhorn, Corpse Hauler, Suntail Hawk, Archaeomancer, Duress, Ground Shaker Sliver, we have Nightwing Shade, another Charging Griffin, pretty nice, Flyers are always nice in a lot of different formats, uh, Disperse, we have a Millstone again, Corrupt, Windstorm, and our rare here is Domestication, so and enchants a creature for four, uh, two generic double blue. You in, you control the enchanted creature, and at the beginning of your end step, if the enchanted creature's power is four or greater, sacrifice domestication. So it only allows us to grab smaller creatures, but at the same time, if we have some ability that allows us to sacrifice that creature or like fling it and be able to deal damage to our opponent based on its power or toughness or anything like that, then it's a pretty cool ability that we can just kind of play around with, a cool interaction that is. Um, and then we have a mountain and a tip card here. So, uh, the next thing you want to do is you want to go through each one of your colors and just take a look at what you have overall. So, let's start off here with red. So, things that seem pretty awesome for us, uh, the Mollhorn is a 5-3 for 4, it has to attack each combat unless we control Advocate of the Beast. It's not necessarily bad, it's a 5-3 creature, a 3 toughness makes it a little bit more downsided, um, 
but at the same time, it still has five power. If we're able to get through, it ends up being pretty nice for us. Uh, we have Thunder Strike, Seismic Stomp, Thorncaster Sliver, which is pretty nice. Um, if we if we can go around like Tribal Slivers, that could be a thing. Uh, Young Pyromancer, Canyon Minotaur, Smelt. Uh, the Cyclops Tyrant, which is a six cost, three, four, and can't block creatures with power two or less, but has Intimidate, so that's a form of evasion. We have two of those, one of them's Foil. Flesh Ball per Giant enters in and destroys target creature with power, or toughness two or less, not power, uh, but it's a four, 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 seven. Dragon Hatchling, which has flying and fire breathing, so uh, it's a zero, one for a two, which is pretty weak, but for every one red that we put into it, it gets a little bit bigger, so we definitely like that. Uh, Lava Axe deals 5 damage to target player for 5, which is alright as filler, but it's not necessarily something we just want to like auto-include. It's um, not necessarily something like really, really good. Uh, barrage of Expendables, so we could have that synergy with Domestication. Uh, it's 1 red sack a creature, and it deals 1 damage to target creature or player. That's definitely something. Uh, we have another Dragon Hatchling, so that's nice. And we have Shock, which deals 2 damage to target creature or player. Uh, so Shock can be used, of course, just to deal damage to our opponent, but it can be also used to get rid of small creatures that have 2 toughness or 1 toughness. Um, it can also be used to respond to our opponent doing things like putting enchantments on creatures or using a buff spell like Giant Growth on a creature. Um, so long as that we can kill it with the shock before that effect resolves. We just put it on the stack and we have the shock resolve and get rid of the creature before anything else big happens. So, um, the big things that stand out here, uh, we do have the thorn caster that is quite nice for us. Um, I suppose the young pyromancer is not bad either if we can go along and play like a lot of instants or sorceries. Um, and then the canyon minutes are overall, it's just... It's a solid creature. Uh, whenever going through all of your colors, you want to still look for creatures that are able-bodied, that they're solid. They may not have like amazing abilities or any abilities at all, but overall, they're still pretty solid-bodied. So a 3-3 three, three for 4 isn't that amazing whenever you're going into big constructed formats, but for a limited, it does serve a pretty decent purpose. So... Um... We have that. We also have the Thunder Strike as filler. And that seems to be pretty much the bulk of what seems good in red. So the two Dragon Hatchlings, Shock, the Maulhorn, Thorncaster Sliver, Young Pyromancer, and the Canyon Minotaur are things that really just kind of stand out as being good deck building cards to include. Out of blue, we have Domestication, which is pretty nice for us. It's not bad at all. Uh, we have Disperse, and we actually have a few of them. I remember seeing them. So we have two, and that seems to be it. So we have two of them, and it's return target non-land permanent uh, to its owner's hand. So we can bounce back like creatures, enchantments that our opponents have, or anything like that. We can just bounce them back, and we can uh, either play like a more tempo game, or we can just keep our opponent from doing things, and we can stall out until we get answers for what our opponent's doing. So uh, domestication, the two dispersed stand out. Uh, other things that are pretty nice are things like Claustrophobia. Claustrophobia is a really awesome enchantment to have. Um, so we actually have two of those, and it enters the battlefield and taps Enchanted Creature. Um, and the Enchanted Creature doesn't untap during its controller's untap step, so we have two of those, and it's kind of like pseudo-removal. Uh, we're able to just get around big, fat creatures that our opponents may have gotten in their sealed pool. Uh, Messenger Drake is awesome with flying. It's a 3-3 three, three for 5, which is a little bit undersided, but uh, at the same time, like, it's still evasion and it can get through. But if it happens to die, we can draw a card off of it. And I think we only have one of those. Yeah, we only have one of those. Uh, we have Archaeomancers. So we have two of those, which can play around if we want to go, like, blue and red. And uh, if we had more red, I'd be more inclined to play, like, blue-red. But Archaeomancer lets us get back uh, instants or sorceries that are in our graveyard. So we can play around like Young Pyromancer by playing more instants or sorceries. Uh, we have Essence Scatter, which counters creature spells, which is nice when our opponent gets to playing like bigger things. Uh, we can keep our Essence Scatter to be able to counter them out. We have Time Ebb, which puts target creature on top of its owner's library. So it kind of throws them off of their game. Uh, being able to put it on top of their library assures you that that's the card that they're going to draw the following turn. Um, so 
it kind of makes things a little bit more difficult for your opponent if they're trying to draw into something else that they know that they have in their deck. Uh, we also have Colossal Whale, which is a pretty nice card for us. It's a 7-drop, which is pretty expensive, but at the same time, uh, it's a 5-5 creature that is just going to wreck the board if it's not dealt with. So uh, it's something that we could consider a bomb of some sort. Um, and then for the rest of the cards that we have, we have Divination, which is awesome for being able to draw. Of course, whenever uh, you're looking at bread, uh, being able to have some draw elements is nice. And for three mana, being able to draw two cards is pretty perfect for us, uh, especially if we're not doing a whole lot in the early game either. Um, and then we have our Merfolk Spies, which aren't really that great. Um, we have Tome Scour. If we had more ways of being able to mill our opponent, it would probably be better. Uh, and the Armor Cankrix, which isn't necessarily amazing. In green, uh, we have Windstorm, dealing X damage to each creature with flying if we're playing up against a... Uh, opponent with a lot of flying creatures or anything like that. Uh, Colonial Tusker, which is a 3-3 three, three for double green. It would probably be more appropriate in a deck that is heavier green, just because we want to have the turn 1 Forest, turn 2 Forest, um, turn 2 Colonial Tusker uh, pretty consistently. Uh, Ranger's Guile, uh, Glade Cover Scout isn't bad at all. Uh, Deadly Recluse is awesome. It's a 1-2 two for 2 with Reach and Death Touch, so that's definitely something to consider um, playing around. It just blocks things and it, with its Death Touch, can effectively get rid of a lot of big creatures. Uh, Root Wall is another solid card that we have. 2-2 uh, two, two for 3 and for 2 mana, 1 generic and 1 green. It gets plus 2, plus 2. You can only be activated once per turn. Um, so that's something to consider. We have Advocate of the Beast, which goes along with our Maulhorn. Uh, at the beginning of your end step, put a plus one, plus one counter on a target beast creature you control, which isn't bad. Um, it's a pretty nice creature. It's a 2-3 three for 3, so it's not way too like undersided. Um, it just has one less power than its mana cost, so... Um, it's not bad. Uh, then we have Troll Hide, plus two, plus two to a creature, and it can regenerate for two mana. Um, and the Rumbling Baloth, which also plays around the Advocate of the Beasts and is just a 4-4 four, four for 4, which, uh, again, just isn't bad. And Fog. So we do have some good things in green. Green's always like one of those solid colors that just works really well in core sets. So um, I wouldn't be necessarily upset with going with green here. Um, we have some cool things that can help us out. So... And there's our green for our white. We had Charging Griffin, and we actually pulled at least two of them. So yeah, two of them. Um, we also have Wall of Swords, which isn't bad. It's a 3-5 for 4 Defender Flying. If anything, it can um, give us a nice edge up against other flying opponents. Uh, we have our... 1-1 one, one for 2 Knight with first strike, and it can gain uh, plus 1, plus 0 oh for every 2 mana that we put into it, 1 generic and 1 white. So that's not entirely bad either. Uh, Blessing for 1 white, it can give enchanted creature plus 1, plus 1. We can use it as many times as we have the uh, the white mana available for us. Um, Dawn Strike Paladin isn't bad either. 2-4 for 5, Vigilance, Lifelink. Pacifism, our pseudo-removal, is definitely really, really high up there. Uh, show of Valor as filler. Uh, effects that give buffs, like Giant Growth, Show of Valor, uh, Thunder Strike. Effects like those are considered filler. They're cards that you want to fill into your deck after you kind of get things going, after you have your shell of the deck that you want to play. Uh, the bombs and the removal and any like really, really good stuff. And then you fill the empty slots with cards like Show of Valor. Uh, Hive Stirrings, we have the, the another knight. So that could be nice for us. Um, the Griffin Sentinel is a little bit undersided. 1-3 three for 3 with Flying and Vigilance. Flying is nice, but um, just because it doesn't have a huge power, it may not be something that we find that beneficial. Uh, we have another Dawn Strike Paladin, however, which is pretty convenient and we have divine favor which is another sort of filler card for us kind of like show of valor but it's permanent because it's an enchantment and it gains us back three life and the enchanted creature gets plus one plus three so that's our white for us and then our black as our last color so corrupt 
The Shade, Duress, Corpse Hauler, Minotaur Abomination. Undead, Undead Minotaur is um, is filler, I would say. Uh, Accursed Spirit is pretty nice as well. Uh, the Intimidate will get there a whole lot of the time. Uh, so, 4 mana, 3-2 with Intimidate. Can't be blocked except by artifact creatures and or uh, creatures that share a color, so black creatures. Um, the Sanguine Bond is nice if uh, if we have like any lifelink kind of effects going on for us. Uh, whenever we gain life, our opponent's going to lose that much life. Um, Hex, Alter's Reap, uh, Lethargy of Blood, and we actually have one, we have two of those, I think. Yeah, we have two of those. So five mana destroy target creature. So those definitely aren't bad. It's a little bit expensive, but. Uh, it's still a sorcery speed removal nonetheless, and it doesn't have a bias for any colors or any certain creatures or anything like that. Um, Lightcaster, another Reap, and another Corrupt. So our black doesn't really look as amazing for us. Uh, we do have the two Lethargy, but at the same time, that's not really enough that would drag us into playing black. We also have the Bond, which is nice, and the Spirit. But for those four cards, it's not something that I would see myself even splashing the black color for, especially because we have a lot of double colors, and uh, the cards just aren't really as impressive. So basically, uh, our colors that we have are going to be pretty much fixated to the four that we have up top here, and then we have our artifacts, our colorless spells. We have Millstone, which we have two of those. Um... Two mana tap, target player puts the top two cards of his or her library into his or her graveyard. Uh, the Pyromancer's Gauntlet, which unfortunately doesn't seem like it will give us enough synergy because we don't have enough of, um, well actually I suppose with like Lava Axe we might be able to just kind of squeak it through, but at the same time the Pyromancer's Gauntlet, if we have like a really huge amount of like shock spells or uh, red like deal damage spells then uh the gauntlet ends up being like a little bit better for us uh, but i don't think for the purpose of the cards that we have and the purpose of deck building that it would provide us much benefit uh we have rod of ruin uh elixir of immortality two mana tap you gain five life and it shuffles um, your graveyard into your library which isn't bad we can get back like removal spells and put it back into our deck and up against like a player that's playing mill and has things like jace memory adept or um if they have a lot of uh tome scours or any cards like that that will put cards from our uh, library into our graveyard we can use elixir to get them back put them into our deck and keep them from winning by uh getting all of our cards into our grave and not having anything to draw for turn um, and then Fire Shrieker. Fire Shrieker is awesome and it goes well in any deck. It gives the equipped creature double strike. You play it for three and equip it for two. So that's definitely something that will be nice for uh, just being able to play it overall and being able to play it in any colors that we ultimately choose. So now, having looked over all of the colors pretty in-depth or somewhat in-depth, now let's try to kind of pick and choose what colors we're going to go for. So. The method that I go about choosing my colors is just taking a look at what we have that's good in the colors. Like if we have a, a lot of like really good cards in one color, then we may just try to go with that color and then try and go and splash in another color or just split it between one and two. So uh, cards that I really liked out of white were Pacifism, the, uh, the Charging Griffins, Wall of Swords, Blessing, the Two Knights, the Dawn Strike Paladins, and that seems to be about good. I also like the Divine Favor as well. Um, it's a nice enchantment to have. Uh, we'll put black over to the side because we already said that black isn't looking as amazing for us. Uh, our Fire Shrieker can definitely be used out of our artifacts and our Elixir of Immortality can definitely be used. Um, if we had more mill elements to our deck, we could go for like the mill stones and we can try to mill out our opponent because it's always a fun way to play formats and a fun way to play the game. Um, We'll put the rest of our white cards down here in our pile of cards that we will look over whenever it comes time to finding more filler elements to our decks. Uh, we'll also put our lands and our tip cards over here as well. Uh, for green, we had the Tusker, we had Deadly Recluse, Rootwalla, Windstorm, Advocate, Trollhide, and the Rumbling Bailoth, among cards that are really nice. 
So things that I really want to play out of green are going to be things like Trollhide because it's a really awesome enchantment. Uh, the Bayloth just because it's overall just the solid creature card to have. Um, and then we have things like Root Walla and Deadly Recluse that are just nice. Um, we may not be able to play the Tusker because we don't have as steady of a green uh, base for us. We don't have enough green cards to commit really heavily on green. Uh, so the Tusker may be something that we won't even see play if we do end up playing green. But having green as a splash for things like Windstorm for hate for uh, flying creatures, uh, that is depending on what we go about. Uh, if we're playing flying creatures ourselves, then Windstorm's not going to be useful for us, of course. Um, that's just not going to be what we want to be playing. We don't want to kill our own creatures while trying to kill our opponents. Um, and then out of blue, we have the Colossal Whale Domestication. We have the two Dispersed, two Claustrophobia. So um, our removal or pseudo-removal that we have or stalling seems pretty good in blue. Uh, the two Claustrophobia are just amazing. Uh, we have our Messenger Drake as well. Our Archaeomancers may not be played, but we do have Time Ebb and Divination. So those are all awesome cards. We'll put the rest of the blue down here. And then for red, we have the two Dragon Hatchlings, which kind of go towards our flying creatures that we have. We have uh, Shock. We have the Malhorn, uh, Thorncaster Sliver. If we want to go for um, the Young Pyromancer, it might provide to be somewhat useful. Uh, and then we have Canyon Minotaur Thunderstrike that seems to work for us. And then if we even want to go for like red, then we have things like Lava Axe to be able to just kind of spice things up and be able to find some more filler slots. So overall, it seems like blue has a lot of nice things for us between like the Claustrophobia as the Disperse. Uh, but blue is a little bit lacking whenever it comes for creatures and we definitely do want to have a decent amount of creatures and have things that we can, get, we can actually play against our opponent. So that's the only downside to blue is we don't have like enough creatures that we can play. Uh, fortunately enough, we do have creatures and pretty decent ones at that in white. So we have our knights, we have our dawn strike paladins, um, we have our griffins, we have the pacifism that we can play, blessing, um, and we also have cards like divine favor um and of course our artifacts can go into any of those colors like i mentioned before uh our green seems all right but it it also seems a little bit lacking like we don't have enough where we could put green as a base and i really like to put green as a base color and then uh find some splash elements for other things in um in the other colors so like having green and having like all the creatures and then finding more removal or finding more answers in other colors seems to be like the most typical thing that I do with the color schemes and like core sets. Um, and then in red, we have some things, but red is typically going to be one of those colors where it has a lot of like removal spells, like spells that are going to be like two mana deal three damage or one mana deal two damage, like our shock or any effects like that, any removal elements like that. So uh, our red seems all right, but I think... Out of the cards that we have, we have a lot of blue, we have a lot of white, and these two colors seem probably the most solid for us. So we're going to try and build around those. I would like to splash in some green, but I don't know how far that's going to take us. I don't know if it's necessarily the wisest thing. Whenever you're playing in a limited event, especially core sets, because there isn't as much fixing or dedicated fixing in the format, um, one thing you want to consider is just playing two colors for... More advanced players, you can get away with running mana bases that are going to be like three color, maybe even sometime four color if you have the fixing for it. But with the cards that we have and the way things are looking, we're probably going to be the safest and most consistent with just running two colors. So uh, our two colors seem to be blue and white. So we'll take our green and we'll put it off to the side um if we really can get away with running green i would still like to play cards like troll hide um deadly recluse and uh the bayloth and root walla but at the same time that doesn't seem like a good enough reason to go for green so we'll put that down on the bottom there and we'll also take our red and put it onto the bottom and now we'll start taking a look at our converted mana costs of the cards that we have. So 
One important thing when you're deck building is to take a look at the different converted mana costs of the cards so that you're not way too heavy on really low drops or way too heavy on high drops because you're in the awkward situation where uh, you're just playing really cheap things and you have really nice early advantage but then when your opponent starts playing bigger creatures you're just kind of stuck you're not playing really good stuff and uh, on the other hand if you have like a lot of really good high-end drops you may not even get to the point where you're playing them if you're wide open during your early turns then your opponent can just take advantage of that and just swing in with a lot of aggro creatures and take you out so uh, we want to have a good balance we want to have a good mana cost curve which we're going to take a look at here and ultimately, you just want to take advantage of all the different converted mana cost cards you have. So let's take a look at it. So we have Divination, uh, we have Time Ebb, and uh, when I'm taking a look at my converted mana cost, this is um, something that I like to do, and I like to separate the creatures from the non-creature spells. Uh, so we have our Messenger Drake up at 5, somewhere up there. Uh, we have Disperse, so let's move things over just a tad here, so we have some space. Uh, we have Claustrophobias, two of those. We have a Domestication. Uh, we have Colossal Whale, which is just going to go over to the end. Uh, we have another uh, Fire Shrieker there. Not sure where I put the, <laughs> the two Disperse there. Uh, Elixir of Immortality, we have Divine Favor. And for our creatures, we have uh, two Dawn Strike Paladin, so more five drops for us. Uh, we have the two knights at our two drops. We have Blessing. Wall of Swords at... Uh, it's at four. Could have sworn it was at three. Uh, we have the two charging griffin, and then we have Pacifism. So, seems pretty cool. Uh, we have a lot of good answers. We have our Claustrophobias, our Pacifisms, Time Ebbs, um, or, well, Time Ebb, and our Disperse cards. Uh... But we don't really have a lot of creatures. We only have, what, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine creatures, which really isn't that much. We want to have a little bit more creatures here. So we're going to jump in and take a look at some of the other cards that we had that we cast aside out of blue and white. All right, so things that we may up, may end up playing are things like Suntail Hawk. So Suntail Hawk is only a 1-1 one, one for 1 white, but if we're able to just keep on getting through with that 1 damage, it could provide to be pretty nice for us. And if we effectively can just keep tapping down our opponent's creatures or keep them from attacking, then we can ultimately just get through for a lot of damage while our opponent's just sitting there not doing anything. So we may play the Suntail Hawk. It might end up being something nice. Uh, we also have Storn, uh, Stonehorn Chanter, which may or may not be played. I'm kind of looking a little bit more for cheaper cards to play. Griffin Sentinel, a card that I said may not be played just because it's a 1-3 three for 3 with flying. It may end up just being played because we want to have some more creatures in here. And uh, we already have the evasion going on for us, so we may look for more of those types of creatures. We may even play a card like Hive Stirrings because it provides uh, some creatures onto the battlefield, but uh, I'm not entirely sure how much we want to go for that. Um, so, taking a look at our blue and white, we want to grab some efficient creatures. So, the Stonehorn Chanter may get played because it's a 4-4 four, four for 6 and gains Vigilance and Lifelink until the end of the turn for 6 mana. Uh, not necessarily the most impressive card, but when we get to the point where we can play six cost cards, then that's definitely going to be a nice one. Uh, we can also play cards, I guess, like Archaeomancer. Do we have any? Well, I guess we don't really have that many Instance or Sorcery, so we'll keep away from playing that card. Uh, we do have Essence Scatter, uh, and then we have the Merfolk Spies, which have Island Walk, and whenever um, they deal combat damage to a player, that player reveals a card at random from his or her hand, so... That's not as impressive, I would say. Uh, Armored Cancrix and the Siege Mastodon. Not as amazing. We may play the Planar Cleansing, actually. Um, it's a card that is kind of tricky. You don't want to cast it whenever you have a huge advantage over your opponent, of course. But uh, if your opponent is just playing things that you can't deal with, we may consider trying to, like, side it in game two. Um, 
between games. So play game one if our opponent has just ridiculous things that we can't deal with, then we may go for playing or cleansing and be able to play or playing or cleansing. Um, so as it is right now, we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve creatures. And of our creatures, one of them can attack, and that's Wall of Swords. So that's definitely something to consider. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven creatures that can effectively attack and swing in. So like Colossal Whale is definitely uh, one of our big finisher cards that we have going on for us here. Um, so one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24. So we have 24 cards here, which is actually pretty close to what we want to have in a sealed deck. Uh, the way that you want to have your land base for a limited deck is you want to have around 23 spells, creature spells, and uh, other spells. And then you want to have 17 lands. 17 is right around the 40% mark for lands. Uh, in a deck for a 40 card deck and that's pretty perfect for how you want to have it uh, in a deck where you have some good early drops and some good high end drops then 17 is probably going to be the most solid way you want to have your land base but if you're if you have like a lot of really early drops and nothing really going on in the high end stuff like back here then you might want to consider dropping one land and adding in another creature or another spell that's really cheap to cast. Uh, you just want to kind of play things based on what your converted mana cost curve looks like. So uh, we have our cards here. We're going to put that off to the side. And uh, we said that we have 24 here. So we want to look to just kind of drop one more because we do have the Colossal Whale and we don't want to get stuck in the situation where we're at six lands and we don't get that seventh one to be able to cast them. So I think cutting one more land out of here would probably be the most beneficial thing for us. So we may go ahead and take the Elixir of Immortality and we'll take that out. And that's okay because we're not playing against any decks like just straight off the bat, we don't know if we're going to be playing up against anything that has like any mill elements to it. So uh, getting rid of the Elixir of Immortality and just putting it in the sideboard is pretty okay for us. So we'll put that off to the side and then we're going to have our full 23 that we need. So with our 23 here, the next thing that we want to do is we want to take all of our spells and separate them based on our colors and then we're going to try to figure out how we're going to have our lands because of course we see that we're playing blue white but how do you know how many lands you actually want to include so uh, we're going to separate these we're just going to take them and we're going to separate them by color here so So it seems like we have a lot more white than we do blue. And we just have our Fire Shrieker for our double strike here. So when it comes to separate, separating them, after you have them separated, then you want to count the mana symbols that you have at the top. So for each white that you see on the card, count it and then just keep a tally of them because that is going to go towards calculating how many lands we actually want to have in of uh, a certain type, like planes to islands. Uh, so we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, because the uh, the Dawn Strike Paladin has two white, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16. So we have 16 white. And then for our blue, we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. So we have 14. Even though we have seemingly more white cards than we have blue, we do have some uh, double, or at least a decent amount of double blue cards um, that we have in blue. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. So 14, and just another count here. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16 so it doesn't seem way too far off 16 and 14 is 
pretty fair. We may be able to go with like a half and half or like a 60-40 split with our lands. So we have our basic lands here already. So I have them separated. Like I said before, I have 17 of each and that's where I uh, got the 17 lands and 23 spells split. So uh, when going and preparing for an event, uh, I'll generally just bring 17 of each land and usually you're not going to be constricted to just one color. So uh, 17 is just kind of playing it really safe. So take out all of our whites here and separate it like that. So those are our lands. Now uh, for the split, because we said it's a 16 and 14, we're just going to go and we're going to take one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So there we have uh, 16. And then 17 is going to be our planes just because it's a 16 to 14 split. Uh, we want to have just slightly more weight than we have blue just because of the way that our. Uh, percents go about with the distribution between white and blue. Uh, if you want to go more into calculating it, uh, taking the total amount of mana symbols, dividing it by each color and its number of mana symbols, and you can find the exact percent, then you take that percent to the amount of lands that you have, and that will tell you how many lands that you should have. It'll probably give you like a uh, land point something, like it'll be like 8.4 or 8.3 or something like that and that'll give you like a rough estimate of how many you want to have uh, out of taking your 17 land total so uh, you can go more into that if you want to be more precise but for the purpose of this video we're not really going to worry about it and uh, we have our 17 lands here so 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17. And just count through here again to make sure we have 23. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20. 1, 2, 3. So 23. So 17, 23 split. Seems pretty nice for us. And that's the deck construction. Now... After you construct your deck, naturally you're going to want to play test it a little bit and you're going to want to see how it works and uh, you want to make sure that it's working exactly the way you have it set in your mind and the, th the things are working uh, as planned. So we'll put that off to the side and I'm going to shuffle this off camera here for a quick second. All right, so to save time, I just wanted to shuffle things up a little bit here. I'm going to show you a couple more shuffles just so you know I'm not stacking the deck or anything like that. I'm going to also take it and just shuffle it once up like this. And then we're just going to do a cut just to show you that I'm not stacking the cards or anything like that just for the purpose of the video. So we'll draw our seven here. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And we'll take a look at what we have. So only one land so far. Two lands. Uh, so doesn't seem overly terrible, but because of the double blue for things like claustrophobia, it might not be something that we want to keep. Uh, I'm sure if we get like one blue, we can just kind of roll with it. Um, so this is probably not something that I would keep in terms of a hand, but just for the sake of things, let's go for it. Let's be a little bit bold and risky here. So planes on turn one and we draw. Unfortunately, it's a blue card that we can't cast. So we'll just go with planes and pass turn. Then we have our island. So on the right course there. Uh, so the things that are open for us to play it would be time app disperse. Uh, Charging Griffin is one mana away, and Claustrophobia is another blue away for us. So uh, if our opponent has something that we can put back on top of their library, we can go for it. Chances are, early on, it's not going to be something that's going to be as rewarding for us using it. But if our opponent goes and plays a creature turn two, and turn three puts on some big, huge enchantment that's going to make it uh, really nice, then we can go and put the creature back on top of their library, and that enchantment's going to go to the grave. So that could be something that could be a good play for us. So uh, we draw another land for a turn, and then we do have the island, so that gives us our double blue and double white as well, giving us four mana open, and then we can play Charging Griffin. So didn't end up being a awful hand at all, uh, even though the starting hand wasn't as 
uh, great. It was pretty subpar, but being able to draw into the cards that we need is pretty awesome. So we can play our Charging Griffin, then we pass our turn. We draw and we have another Claustrophobia, so we definitely have answers to what our opponent's doing. So let's assume that we use Claustrophobia on one of our opponent's creatures. Uh, we can swing in with the Charging Griffin, and then we'll pass it back here. We have Divination, which is pretty useful for us. Uh, we can go ahead and use that. We can go... In this case, I would probably go for uh, using Divination and paying double white and one blue, just because if we hit another land, then we can still use Disperse. Um, however, if we hit, like, a Plains and we went, like, double blue and one white, then we might not have the mana open for Disperse. So, uh, just for the sake of keeping things a little bit more appropriate, we have a double white card, so there's no chance of playing it anyway. All right, we're going to use Divination and draw two cards here. So, we have a Plains and an Island as well, so... I guess it wouldn't have really mattered, ultimately, but you never know. You don't know that. Um, so we'll play our planes just for the sake of things, and we can pass the turn using Disperse if we want. Let's assume we'll use it up, use up our resources, swing in with the Griffin, of course. Keep things going. We have a Knight. Play land for turn. We're at six. One turn away from Colossal Whale, or one land drop away from Colossal Whale. So um, we can play our Dawnstrike Paladin for five. Any combination that we want, um, you can either go for a triple white or triple blue, doesn't really matter. Uh, swinging in if open. Um, and then we have our another island, we have another land drop, and that is the seven for us to be able to play the Colossal Whale, which of, uh, of course is going to be a huge threat. Your opponent may end up just getting rid of it, but if it ends up sticking and your opponent can't deal with it, or if Island Walk is relevant and they can't block it, then you're just going to be swinging in with a big, fat 5-5 five, five creature that every time it attacks is going to exile something underneath itself. So uh, it doesn't seem that bad at all for us. So it seems like a pretty nice little playtest session. It seems pretty good, and it, it seems pretty all right for what we want going on. We have our elements that are going to stall out the game until we can get a big fatty like Colossal Whale on the board. We have some evasion going on for us that will allow us to get through and overall our creatures even though we don't have massive amounts of them still end up getting the job done um, if permitted so uh, unless our opponent has like something really huge going on for them that is just going to deal with every single thing that we play this seems like a pretty solid deck for sealed deck for the sealed deck format and for uh, m14 so that is our deck that we built with this sealed deck test session here so if you guys enjoyed the video i would appreciate it if you thumbs up this video and subscribe to the channel for more instructional videos information and all that cool stuff for magic the gathering uh, you guys can find more instructional tutorial style videos down in the description below uh, i have a playlist of the previous episodes of how to build a sealed deck that I've covered on the channel, so you guys can check that out if you have some time to kill. I know they're kind of lengthy videos, but at the same time, uh, the knowledge is kind of transferable between the different sets and the skills that you learn from watching these types of videos will help you in different various formats. Maybe it's going to be like another set like Theros that comes out after uh, M14, and uh, you may be able to transfer the knowledge of how to go about looking for good cards or anything like that into different sets so hopefully you guys enjoyed it uh if you were able to sit through this entire video thank you for sitting through and watching it and until next time guys have yourselves a wonderful fun-filled magic the gathering day